Aracocra are bird-like humanoids that inhabit the elemental plane of air, specifically the Howling Gyre, characterized by powerful winds and relentless rains. They are guardians of their peaceful realm, protecting it from creatures of the elemental plane of earth, particularly gargoyles, with whom they hold a deep-seated rivalry. These creatures serve the Wind Dukes of Akka, conducting aerial patrols across the plains to locate temples of elemental evil. They either engage in combat with the malevolent elemental creatures, or report their findings to the Wind Dukes. On the material plane, Arakakra build their nests atop high mountains, especially those near portals to the elemental plane of air. From these lofty perches, they vigilantly watch for signs of elemental intrusions and potential threats to their home plane. Arakokra embrace a nomadic lifestyle akin to the ever-shifting wind. They dedicate years of their lives to safeguarding a region against elemental evil if needed. However, they have no understanding of political borders or property ownership. Material wealth, like gems and gold, holds little value in their eyes. To Arakakra, one should use what is necessary and then let the rest be carried away by the wind, available for others to utilize. The Wind Dukes of Akka, whom Arakakra serve, are descended from a race of elemental beings known as the Vaadi, who once ruled numerous worlds. A significant threat to their rule emerged in the form of the Queen of Chaos, sparking an interplanar war against the Vaati. The Abaleth, ancient rulers of primordial waters, reigned before the arrival of gods. Possessing formidable psychic powers, they dominated life forms, considered gods by their subjects. But the arrival of true gods ended their reign, leaving an enduring grudge. Abaleths possess flawless memories, storing ancient lore. They reside in watery realms, demanding worship and loyalty. By consuming others, they gain knowledge. With telepathy, they discern desires, promising rewards in exchange for obedience. Immortal in essence, Abaleths return when destroyed. They harbor dreams of reclaiming dominion over the world and plot meticulously. Abaleths are immense, serpentine beings with natural armor, formidable strength, unmatched intelligence, and powerful tentacles and tails. Their unique abilities include amphibiousness, mucus clouds causing disease, and probing telepathy to discern desires. Abaleths create lairs in underwater lakes or ocean depths, often surrounded by ancient remnants. They primarily live underwater, but occasionally surface. Angels are celestial beings sent forth by deities to carry out their divine agendas, whether for benevolent or malevolent purposes. They possess an awe-inspiring beauty and presence that can either inspire reverence or foretell impending doom depending on their mission. These celestial entities are created from the astral essence of benevolent gods, endowing them with immense power and foresight. Angels tirelessly execute the will of their deities, even if it means serving deities whose alignments differ from their own. However, they are bound to follow only lawful and good commands. An angel is unwavering in its commitment to slay evil creatures, driven by its embodiment of law and goodness. This unyielding nature may lead to a sense of superiority, especially when conflicting with the goals of other creatures. Angels are sent to aid mortals only in the most dire of circumstances, acting as commanders rather than servants. Some angels, despite their wisdom, may commit an evil act driven by pride, marking them as fallen angels. Fallen angels lose their connection to their deities but retain their power. They often seek rulership over portions of the abyss or a place within the hierarchy of the nine hells. Others choose a solitary existence on the material plane, living in disguise as hermits. Redemption can transform fallen angels into powerful allies dedicated to justice and compassion. Angels possess an immortal nature, requiring no food, drink, or sleep. Divas are a specific type of angel that acts as divine messengers or agents across different planes, including the material plane, the Shadowfell, and the Feywild. They have the ability to assume forms suitable for the realm they are sent to.
Legends speak of Devas taking mortal form for extended periods, providing aid, hope, and courage to virtuous individuals. They can take various shapes, but they typically prefer appearing as innocuous humanoids or animals. When necessary, they reveal their true form as beautiful humanoid-like creatures with silvery skin, radiant hair, luminous eyes, and large feathered wings. Planeters serve as the formidable instruments of the gods they represent, manifesting their deity's power in tangible ways. They can bring rain to alleviate droughts or unleash insect plagues to destroy crops. Their celestial senses detect falsehoods and their radiant gaze pierces through deceptions. Planetars are muscular, hairless beings with opalescent green skin and white feathered wings. They often wield immense swords and eagerly undertake missions that involve combating fiends. Solars are beings of unparalleled glory and might. In battle, their swords move independently, and a single arrow from their bows strikes its target with deadly precision. There are said to be only 24 solars, each serving as a steward of a specific deity. The rest remain in contemplation, awaiting the time when their services are needed to defend the cause of good against cosmic threats. Animated objects are creations infused with potent magic, designed to carry out the commands of their creators. In the absence of commands, they adhere to their most recent directive, carrying it out to the best of their ability. While some animated objects, especially those originating from the Feywild, may converse fluently or adopt personas, most are simplistic automatons. These constructs possess a constructed nature, requiring no sustenance or rest, as they do not breathe, eat, drink, or sleep. However, the magic that breathes life into them dissipates when an animated object reaches zero hit points, rendering it inanimate and of little use. One example of an animated object is the animated armor. It appears as an empty suit of steel plate armor, moving with ponderous yet relentless determination. Many of these magical guardians are enchanted with scripted speech, enabling them to issue warnings, demand passwords, or pose riddles. Rare instances of animated armor are even capable of holding actual conversations. Another variant is the flying sword, a blade that gracefully dances through the air, fighting with unwavering confidence as it is impervious to harm. While swords are the most common weapons to be animated through magic, other items like axes, clubs, daggers, maces, spears, and self-loading crossbows have also been known to take on this form. The Rug of Smothering is a treacherous creation that often catches intruders by surprise. Intricate in design, these rugs can range from finely woven carpets fit for royalty to coarse mats in humble abodes. They can be designed to mimic the appearance of other magic items, often fooling those who attempt to detect magic. However, stepping onto or uttering a command word near one will quickly ensnare victims as the rug tightens around them, often leading to dire consequences. The Ankheg is a formidable insectoid creature, characterized by its massive, many-legged form. It possesses long, twitching antennae that react to movements in its vicinity. Its legs end in sharp, hook-like structures, which are well-suited for both burrowing and capturing prey. The Ankheg's most striking feature is its powerful mandibles, capable of snapping a small tree in half. Ankhegs are known as lurkers in the earth. They employ their formidable mandibles for digging intricate tunnels deep beneath the earth's surface. During a hunt, an Ankheg burrows upwards, remaining concealed below the ground until its sensitive antennae detect movement from above. At that moment, it erupts from the earth's depths and seizes its prey with its mandibles, subjecting them to a crushing grip. During this process, the Ankheg secretes acidic digestive enzymes, aiding in the breakdown of its victim's flesh. This macabre method of consumption allows it to swallow its prey with greater ease. Additionally, the Ankheg can expel corrosive acid as a weapon to incapacitate or kill adversaries. The Ankheg primarily preys on pastures and forests, favoring areas abundant with grazing livestock and game. As such, it is often considered a significant threat to farmers and rangers, causing considerable damage to local ecosystems. As Ankhegs burrow through the earth, they leave behind narrow, partially collapsed tunnels. 
These tunnels can contain various remnants of ankeg activity, including discarded exoskeletons from their molting process, hatched ankeg eggs, and the grisly remains of their victims. These remains may include scattered coins or other valuables, often left behind during the chaos of an ankeg attack. Azers hail from the elemental plane of fire and are known for their expertise in crafting, mining, and their deep-seated animosity towards the Ifrit. At first glance, an Azer may appear as a male dwarf, but this is a deceptive exterior. Beneath their metallic-looking skin, Azers are beings of fire, a fact made evident by their fiery hair and beard. These creatures are not born, but crafted. Each Azer is meticulously created from bronze by another Azer, who infuses a portion of their own inner flame into the new creation. The uniqueness of the crafting process ensures that Azers have distinctive features and limits their population, making them relatively rare. Azers make their homes in a kingdom situated on the border between the elemental plane of earth and the elemental plane of fire. This kingdom comprises a range of mountains and volcanoes, with towering fortresses scattered throughout. Azers are expert miners, extracting precious metals and gems from the earth beneath mountain peaks, volcanic calderas, and rivers of magma. They diligently patrol the tunnels and passes of their realm, defending against salamander raiders under the command of their Ifrit masters. Their history is marked by a profound enmity with the Ifrit. In the past, the two races were allies and collaborated to create the City of Brass, a magnificent city. However, the Ifrit betrayed the Azers in an attempt to enslave them and protect the city's secrets. While occasional skirmishes occur, a full-scale war has thus far been avoided. Azers believe that their knowledge of the hidden pathways into the City of Brass is the only thing keeping the Ifrit from attacking in force. Azers are renowned as masters of metalwork and gemcraft. They create exquisite works of art and magic items from the gems and precious metals abundant in their volcanic habitat. These treasures hold immense value for them, and they often send expeditions across the plains to acquire rare metals and gemstones. When summoned to the material plane through magic, Azers are typically sought to assist in forging intricate magic items or crafting works of art. Their unparalleled skill in these crafts is highly esteemed. Azers have no need for food, drink, or sleep, as they are living embodiments of fire. Banshees, haunting specters of the night, are born from the tormented souls of female elves. These vengeful spirits manifest as ethereal, wraith-like figures, their appearances reminiscent of their elven origins. A banshee's visage is marked by a contorted face framed by a wild tangle of hair, while its form is draped in flowing, wispy rags. The creation of a banshee is the result of divine wrath. These beings were once elves blessed with exceptional beauty, but they squandered this gift by using it to corrupt and manipulate others. Elves afflicted by the curse of the Banshee find no solace in life and are filled only with distress in the presence of the living. As the curse progresses, their minds and bodies deteriorate until death transforms them into these undead entities. Banshees are bound to the place of their demise, unable to venture more than five miles from that location. They are trapped in an eternal cycle, forced to relive every moment of their lives with perfect recall, yet persistently refusing to accept responsibility for their downfall. Their vanity endures even in undeath. Banshees covet beautiful objects such as fine jewelry, paintings, statues, and other works of art. However, they harbor an intense aversion to mirrors, unable to bear the sight of their own horrifying existence. A single glimpse of their reflection is enough to send a banshee into a violent rage. Banshees, like other undead creatures, do not require air, food, drink, or sleep to sustain themselves. Basilisks are formidable creatures known for their ability to turn their prey into stone. Travelers might stumble upon what appears to be remarkably lifelike stone carvings of wildlife with missing parts as if bitten off. 
Seasoned explorers recognize these relics as warnings, indicating the presence of a basilisk nearby. These adaptable predators thrive in arid, temperate, or tropical climates, often making their lairs in caves or other sheltered locations, most frequently underground. Basilisks are born and raised in captivity, making them trainable. Trained basilisks can be taught to avoid meeting the gaze of individuals their master wishes to protect from their petrifying gaze, but they remain imposing guardian beasts. This is why basilisk eggs are highly sought after. The most distinctive feature of basilisks is their gaze of stone. They are skilled hunters, and they don't need to chase their prey. Locking eyes with a basilisk can trigger a swift transformation, turning the victim into porous stone. Basilisks, with their powerful jaws, can then consume the petrified creature. The stone consumed eventually reverts to its organic form within the basilisk's gullet. There are rumors that certain alchemists possess the knowledge to process the contents of a basilisk's gullet, extracting fluids that, when handled properly, can be turned into an oil. This oil has the unique ability to reverse the petrification process, restoring petrified creatures to flesh and life. However, this method has its limitations, as any body parts lost while in stone form remain absent upon revival. If a vital part, such as the head, is detached during the petrification process, revivification using the oil becomes impossible. The Behir is a serpentine creature that moves along floors and scales walls to reach its prey. Its most deadly weapon is its lightning breath, capable of incinerating most creatures. The Behir has a monstrous appearance, resembling a combination of a centipede and a crocodile. Its scaled hide ranges from deep blue to pale blue on its underside. Behirs prefer to lair in locations that are inaccessible to other creatures, such as deep pits, high cave walls, or caverns reached through narrow, twisting tunnels. They use their dozen legs to move through their lairs with ease, and when they need to move quickly, they can fold their legs beside their bodies and slither like a snake. After capturing prey, Behirs swallow them whole, and then enter a period of dormancy while they digest their meal. During this time, they choose hiding places within their lair, where intruders might overlook them. Behirs have a deep-seated hatred for dragons, stemming from ancient times when giants and dragons were locked in an endless war. Storm giants created the first Behirs as weapons against dragons, and this enmity remains. Behirs never make their lairs in areas inhabited by dragons. If a dragon attempts to establish a lair too close to a Behir's lair, the Behir is compelled to either kill the dragon or drive it away. Only when the dragon proves too powerful does the Behir seek a new lair site at a significant distance. A single glance at a beholder reveals the depths of its foul and otherworldly nature. These creatures are aggressive, hateful, and greedy to their very core. They view all other beings as beneath them, playthings to be toyed with or obliterated at their whim. A beholder's spherical body perpetually levitates, with a colossal, bulging eye atop a toothy maw. A ring of smaller eye stalks wraps around its form, twisting and turning to maintain constant vigilance. Even when slumber beckons, a beholder closes its central eye but leaves the others open, alert to any danger. Beholders are deeply paranoid, convinced that the world conspires against them. They believe other creatures resent their brilliance and magical prowess, dismissing these lesser beings as crude and repugnant. Beholders constantly suspect plots against them, even in the absence of any actual threats. This disdain extends to their own kind, with each beholder convinced that its form is the ideal representation of their kind. Even slight physical differences can lead to lifelong enmity between beholders. Some sport chitinous plates for protection, while others have smooth hides. Eye stalks vary from tentacle-like writhing to crab-like joints, and even subtle differences in coloration can fuel their hatred. Some beholders channel their xenophobia into tyranny, these eye tyrants enslave other creatures, founding and ruling over vast empires. They establish domains within or beneath major cities, commanding networks of agents to serve their sinister purposes. Given their aversion to sharing territory, 
Most beholders withdraw to frigid hills, abandoned ruins, or deep caverns. Beholder layers are characterized by vertical passageways connecting stacked chambers, optimized for the beholder's mobility and impeding intruders. The lofty ceilings enable them to float and harass foes on the ground. Within their lairs, beholders adorn chambers with trophies, including petrified adventurers frozen in their final horrified moments, parts of defeated beholders, and magic items wrested from powerful adversaries. Their self-worth is measured by their acquisitions, and they jealously guard their treasures. In rare instances, beholders undergo a macabre transformation, emerging as death tyrants. These undead abominations retain the cunning and much of the magic they possessed in life, but are now fueled by undeath. A death tyrant appears as a massive bare skull with a red pinpoint of light in its hollow eye socket. Ten spectral eyes hover above it, glaring in all directions. They lord over other creatures, even converting former slaves and enemies into undead minions. Zombies created by a death tyrant serve as guardians, combat fodder, and bait for traps. Death tyrants, driven by insatiable hunger for power, launch relentless assaults on humanoid settlements. They use their eye rays to obliterate any opposition, building armies of undead as they conquer cities. Left unchecked, a death tyrant can decimate entire populations, creating overwhelming forces of zombies. The chilling presence of beholders and their death tyrant brethren warps the regions around their lairs. These effects include an eerie sense of being watched, strange, subtle alterations to the environment, and unsettling marks on cave walls. If a beholder or death tyrant perishes, these effects dissipate over time. A spectator is a lesser beholder, summoned from another plane through a magical ritual. This ritual requires four beholder eye stalks as components which are consumed by the magic. A spectator has four eye stalks, two on each side of its central four-foot diameter body. Summoned spectators serve as magical guardians. They protect a designated location or treasure of their summoner's choice for 101 years allowing only their summoner to access it. If the item they guard is stolen or destroyed before the 101 years are up, the summoned spectator disappears, otherwise it remains steadfast in its duty. Communication with a spectator primarily happens through telepathy, although they can speak. Years of isolation can cause peculiar quirks in their personalities, such as inventing imaginary enemies, referring to themselves in the third person, or mimicking their summoner's voice. Like other beholders, they believe themselves to be the epitome of their kind and have a strong aversion to other spectators. When two spectators encounter each other, they usually engage in a fight to the death. Once a spectator's service is complete, it is free to pursue its own desires. Many choose to stay in the places they once guarded, especially if their summoners have passed away. Without their former purpose, spectators often display their quirks more prominently. Awakened plants known as blights are imbued with intelligence and mobility. They thrive in lands tainted by darkness, serving as instruments of ancient evil and spreading corruption. Originating from the roots of the Gultheus tree, blights trace their lineage back to a vampire named Gultheus. His demise led to the infusion of his evil essence into a wooden stake. This stake eventually sprouted into a sapling that was discovered by a mad druid and transplanted into an underground grotto. From this Gultheus tree came the seeds that gave rise to the first blights. Blights carry out a dark conquest wherever they take root. A Gultheus tree can infest and corrupt a forest, spreading its evil through roots and soil, transforming other plants into blights. These corrupted lands see rapid growth of plants and vines, overrunning structures, trails, and roads. Entire villages can vanish within days when infested by blights. Controlled by the evil that spawned them, blights act under a Gultheus tree's influence, perpetuating the legacy of their malevolent origin by targeting old foes or seeking valuable treasures. Needle blights resemble shuffling humanoids from a distance, but up close they reveal their true nature as horrid plant creatures covered in quivering clumps of conifer-like needles. 
They attack by launching these needles at their foes or using them in melee combat. When a threat is detected, needle blights release pollen to alert others, converging on their enemies to saturate their roots with blood. Twig blights, when food is scarce, can root in the soil and resemble woody shrubs. They ambush prey at campsites and watering holes, lying in wait to catch those who come to drink or rest. When they decide to move, their branches form a humanoid body with a head and limbs. Twig blights often gather in groups to blend in with natural vegetation or debris, making them hard to spot. Vine blights appear as masses of slithering creepers lurking in the undergrowth to ambush nearby prey. They can animate surrounding plants to entangle and hinder their enemies before attacking. Vine blights are unique among blights as they can speak, using a fractured version of their deceased master's voice to taunt victims or negotiate with powerful foes. Bugbears, fearsome creatures born for battle and mayhem, thrive through raiding and hunting. They have a strong disdain for being bossed around, but are willing to fight for powerful masters as long as there's the promise of bloodshed and treasure. These goblinoids often associate with their cousins, hobgoblins, and goblins. Bugbears have a tendency to enslave goblins they encounter and intimidate hobgoblins into providing them with gold and food in exchange for serving as scouts and shock troops. Although bugbears can be unreliable allies, their strength is recognized by goblins and hobgoblins, making them a potent force. Bugbears follow the deity Rugek, who resides on the plain of Acheron. In the absence of their goblinoid kin, bugbears form loose warbands, each led by its fiercest member. They believe that in death, their spirits have a chance to fight alongside Rugek and seek to prove their worthiness by defeating as many foes as possible. Despite their imposing physical presence, bugbears are surprisingly stealthy and excel at setting ambushes. They are quick to flee when faced with superior forces and can be dependable mercenaries as long as they are provided with food, drink, and treasure. However, bugbears tend to forget any bonds when their lives are in danger even leaving behind wounded comrades to aid their own escape. In some cases, a wounded bugbear might help pursuers track down its former companions if doing so increases its chances of survival. The bulet, often referred to as a land shark, is a formidable predator that instills fear wherever it resides. These creatures are insatiable feeders and are known for their irascible and rapacious nature. Bulets are fearless and will attack without hesitation, paying no heed to superior numbers or strength. As underground hunters, bulets use their powerful claws to tunnel through the earth when hunting. They are relentless, uprooting trees, causing landslides in loose slopes, and leaving sinkholes in their wake. When they detect vibrations in the soil and rock, signaling the movement of potential prey, Bulets burst to the surface with jaws wide open, ready to strike. Bulets are wandering monsters that roam across temperate lands, feeding on any animals and humanoids they come across. These creatures have a peculiar taste for halfling flesh, and they take particular delight in chasing plump halflings across open fields. Bulets have no fixed lairs and instead have hunting territories that can span up to 30 miles wide. Their territorial boundaries are determined solely by the availability of food, and when they've depleted the resources in an area, they move on. Humanoid settlements often fall victim to their terror, as bulets pursue and consume their panicked inhabitants. These creatures are solitary by nature, shunned by all other creatures. Bulets are indiscriminate eaters and will even prey upon other predators and fellow bulets, they come together only for the purpose of mating, which often ends in a bloody confrontation resulting in the male's death and subsequent consumption. The origins of bullets are shrouded in mystery and speculation. Some scholars believe they are the result of a deranged wizard's experiments involving the crossbreeding of snapping turtles and armadillos with demonic influences. Bullets have been thought to be extinct at times, only to reappear after years without sightings. Due to the scarcity of sightings of their young, some speculate that bulets maintain secret nesting grounds from which adults venture out into the world. 
Bullywugs, frog-headed amphibious humanoids, inhabit watery and damp environments like rainy forests, marshes, and wet caves. Their existence is characterized by a harsh and sinister way of life. They are always hungry and show a preference for attacking in large numbers whenever possible. However, when faced with formidable foes, they tend to flee in search of easier prey. Their skin varies in color, including shades of green, gray, and mottled yellow, allowing them to blend in with their surroundings. Bullywugs wear crude armor and wield simple weapons, using their powerful bite when enemies get too close. Within the Bullywug society, they consider themselves the rightful rulers of the swamps. They follow a peculiar set of customs and etiquette when dealing with outsiders and each other, all of which revolve around the whims of their self-proclaimed leaders, the Lords of the Muck. Bullywugs have a habit of using grand-sounding titles, perform exaggerated acts of bowing, and constantly vie for the favor of their superiors. Bullywugs have two main paths to advancement within their society. They can either eliminate rivals through covert means while keeping their actions hidden, or they can find valuable treasures or magical items to present as tribute to their lords. These gifts are intended to gain favor, but over time, they are often reduced to shabby, neglected items. Subsequently, Bullywug leaders demand more tribute, setting a cycle of greed and competition among their subjects. When it comes to diplomacy, Bullywugs delight in asserting dominance over trespassers in their territories. Instead of outright killing intruders, their warriors attempt to capture them. Captives are brought before the king or queen, who is typically a larger-sized Bullywug, these rulers force captives to beg for mercy and can be swayed by bribes, flattery, or treasures. Despite their self-proclaimed regal status, Bullywug lords have deep-seated insecurities and crave both fear and respect from outsiders. Bullywugs communicate through a language that resembles croaking, enabling them to share information quickly across long distances in the swamp. This communication system also allows them to form strong bonds with giant frogs, which they train as guardians and hunters. Some larger frogs even serve as mounts, and their ability to swallow prey whole makes them efficient at carrying captured creatures back to the Bullywug villages. A cambion is the result of the union between a fiend, typically a succubus or incubus, and a humanoid, often a human. These creatures exhibit a blend of characteristics inherited from both parents, with prominent features such as horns, leathery wings, and sinewy tails that reflect their otherworldly lineage. From a young age, cambions display a predisposition for malevolence. As they mature, their wickedness and perversity become increasingly pronounced, shocking even their most devoted mortal parents. Cambions are destined to become ruthless overlords of mortals, with ambitions to assert dominance over others. They are known to manipulate and lead uprisings in towns and cities, rallying gangs of humanoids and lesser devils to serve their nefarious agendas. For those Cambians who find themselves serving their fiendish parent, their loyalty is driven by a complex mix of admiration and fear. They anticipate a future where they will ascend to positions of power and prominence. In the Nine Hells, Cambians play various roles, including serving as soldiers, envoys, and personal attendants to greater devils. In the Chaotic Abyss, their authority is determined by their ability to amass strength and exert their will over others. Among the Cambians sired by the demon lord Grazist, distinctive traits set them apart. These individuals possess charcoal black skin, cloven hooves, six-fingered hands, and an otherworldly, captivating beauty. They often become agents of chaos, working alongside Grazist to spread discord and upheaval throughout the multiverse. Carrion crawlers are voracious scavengers, diligently seeking out and devouring decaying flesh. They aggressively defend their territory against any intruders or disturbances to their gruesome feasts. These creatures are natural carrion eaters, guided by their keen sense of smell to locate areas where death is abundant and competition from other scavengers is limited. They typically establish their lairs in places such as caves, sewers, dungeons, forested marshes, battlefields, and cemeteries. Carrion crawlers are known to roam in search of food, with their tentacles probing the air for the scent of blood or decay. 
In tunnels or ruins, they can often be seen scurrying along the ceiling to avoid contact with other dangerous denizens of the darkness while surprising potential prey. Carrion crawlers exhibit remarkable patience as predators. They are drawn to sources of light, following them from a distance for extended periods, hoping to catch the scent of blood. Despite their significant size, these creatures are adept at setting up ambushes by lying in wait around blind corners, luring unsuspecting victims into their grasp. When confronted with potential prey or intruders, carrion crawlers employ their paralyzing poison. Once a victim succumbs to paralysis, the carrion crawler ensnares it with its tentacles and drags it to a secluded location, such as a high ledge or an isolated passageway, where it can safely consume its meal. Afterward, the monster resumes patrolling its territory while waiting for its next meal to ripen. Centaurs are reclusive wanderers and seers of the wilderness who prefer to avoid conflicts, but can be formidable foes when provoked. These creatures belong to nomadic tribes that traverse lands with mild to hot climates. They are well suited to these environments, often wearing only light furs or oiled skins to protect against the elements. Centaurs rely on hunting and gathering for sustenance and rarely build permanent shelters or use tents during their journeys. Centaur migrations span vast territories and may take decades to complete, ensuring that a tribe might not revisit the same areas for generations. However, this nomadic lifestyle can lead to clashes when centaurs encounter settlements or other creatures that have established themselves along their traditional routes. In cases where a centaur can no longer keep pace with its tribe, it is left behind. Some of these lone centaurs choose to disappear into the wilderness, never to be seen again. Others may find refuge among other races, especially in frontier settlements. These communities often value the centaur's deep knowledge of nature and rely on their insights and wisdom for survival. Despite their reclusive tendencies, centaurs engage in trade with elves and benevolent humanoid caravans they encounter during their wanderings. In some cases, traders might assist wounded or elderly centaurs, escorting them to settlements where they can peacefully spend their remaining days. This willingness to engage in trade and interaction with other races highlights the multifaceted nature of centaur society. Chimeras are monstrous creatures born from the consequences of mortals summoning the demon prince Demogorgon to the material plane. In his demonic cruelty, Demogorgon transformed various creatures into these nightmarish beings, marking their origin as a dark reminder of the presence of demon princes in the world. A typical chimera is a grotesque amalgamation of different animals. It possesses the hindquarters of a large goat, the forequarters of a lion, and the leathery wings of a dragon. Most notably, it has the heads of all three of these creatures. Chimeras are known for their tactics of surprise attacks, often swooping down from the sky to engulf their prey in fiery breath before landing for a more direct confrontation. The nature of a chimera is conflicted as it combines the worst aspects of its composite parts. The influence of its dragon head compels it to amass treasure and indulge in raiding and plundering. The leonine nature drives it to hunt and kill powerful creatures that threaten its territory. Its goat head gives it a stubborn and vicious streak, making it willing to fight to the death when provoked. Chimeras stake out territories as large as 10 miles wide where they hunt wild game and view more potent creatures as rivals to be defeated. Their most prominent adversaries include dragons, griffins, manticores, peritons, and wyverns. During hunts, chimeras take pleasure in the fear and suffering of weaker creatures. They often toy with their prey, inflicting initial wounds and terror before returning to finish the job. While not particularly cunning, chimeras can be swayed by flattery and gifts thanks to their draconic ego. If offered food and treasure, a chimera may spare a traveler. Villains can even gain the services of a chimera by keeping it well fed and ensuring its treasure hoard is well stocked. This makes them formidable, albeit unreliable, servants of evil. Chuls are creatures that have survived from the ancient times of the Aboleth Empire. These crustaceans were originally modified and granted sentience by the Aboleths to serve their purposes. 
In the primeval ages, the Aboleths held dominion over vast oceanic realms, and they sought to extend their influence beyond the waters. However, their aquatic nature limited their reach on the terrestrial world. To overcome this constraint, they created the Chuls. Chuls were designed to be the perfect servants, unwavering in their loyalty and obedience to their Aboleth masters. They were tasked with collecting sentient creatures, gathering magical artifacts, and amassing power, all under the directive of the Aboleths. Over the ages, they grew in size and strength while carrying out these ancient commands. When the Aboleths' empire eventually crumbled with the ascendancy of the gods, the Chuls were left without masters. Nevertheless, they continue to fulfill their original purpose, guarding the ruins of the ancient Aboleth civilization. These ruins are often sought after by treasure hunters and explorers who are lured by rumors and ancient maps. However, the reward for their audacity is typically death, as the Chuls fiercely defend the hoarded wealth and magical artifacts within. Chuls possess an innate ability to sense magic from a distance, making them adept at identifying and safeguarding magical items. When explorers fall victim to their attacks, the Chuls claim their gear and conceal it in hidden locations designated by the Aboleths eons ago. Furthermore, should Chuls come into contact with Aboleths once more, they immediately revert to their old roles, rekindling their ancient psychic bonds and serving the sinister purposes of their creators. This unwavering loyalty to the Aboleths is a testament to the enduring influence of these ancient and enigmatic beings. Cloakers, aptly named for their appearance resembling dark, leathery cloaks, are stealthy predators often found in remote dungeons and caves. These creatures patiently await the arrival of lone or injured prey stumbling through the darkness. Their ability to blend into shadows and strike from the obscurity of the caves is facilitated by their stingray-like bodies composed of cartilage and muscle. When their tail and fins are unfurled, they glide through the darkness, resembling a cloak. Rows of round, black eyes dot their back, and their ivory-colored claws on the cowl resemble bone clasps. However, when a cloaker unfurls and prepares to attack, its pale underside is exposed, revealing its true nature. Its red eyes glow menacingly above rows of sharp teeth, and a long, pendulous tail whips behind it. Cloakers are opportunistic predators, often trailing behind groups of other creatures traversing the Underdark. They prefer to target wounded individuals after battles or pursue herds of Underdark beasts, preying on the sick, weak, or straggling members. They attack swiftly, enveloping and devouring their victims with haste. During their feeding, they employ their whip-like tail for defense, although they rarely engage in combat against dangerous foes or groups of creatures. Additionally, cloakers possess the ability to create illusory duplicates of themselves, enhancing their defensive capabilities. Communication among cloakers is unique, as they exchange information through subsonic moans that are inaudible to most creatures. These moans, when intensified, become audible and evoke feelings of doom and dread in those who hear them. While cloakers prefer isolation, they occasionally convene with other cloakers for mutual defense or to share information about new threats, suitable hunting grounds, or changes in their habitats. After these gatherings, the cloakers typically disperse once again, returning to their solitary and elusive existence. The cockatrice is a creature with a nightmarish appearance resembling a grotesque blend of lizard, bird, and bat. Its infamy lies in its unique and dangerous ability to turn living flesh into stone. While its diet primarily consists of berries, nuts, flowers, and small animals like insects, mice, and frogs, which it swallows whole, these creatures would pose no threat to anything else if not for their extremely aggressive response to even the slightest hint of danger. When faced with a perceived threat, a cockatrice becomes frenzied and reacts fiercely. It takes to the air, squawking loudly and vigorously flapping its wings, while its head darts out to peck at the source of danger. Even the smallest scratch from a cockatrice's beak can be fatal, as the victim slowly begins to petrify, turning into solid stone due to the injury inflicted by the creature. 
This petrification process is a grim and irreversible fate for those unlucky enough to encounter a cockatrice. Coatls are beings of serpentine appearance, known for their benevolence, great intellect, and profound insight. Their most striking features are their brilliantly colored wings, which, coupled with their gentle demeanor, give them an air of celestial origin. These creatures were created by a benevolent deity long forgotten, a god whose worship has faded into obscurity. Originally tasked with guarding and caring for specific divine mandates, many of these responsibilities have been fulfilled or have gone unfulfilled over the ages. Nevertheless, some Kuatls still watch over ancient sources of power, await the fulfillment of forgotten prophecies, or protect the descendants of those they once guided. Despite their celestial heritage, Kuatls prefer to remain concealed, revealing themselves only in the most dire circumstances. They do so to safeguard something of great importance, honor their promises, or keep the secret of their existence. One notable trait of Kuatls is their inability to lie. While they cannot deceive through falsehood, they might choose to withhold information, respond ambiguously, or allow others to draw incorrect conclusions, all done in the service of higher principles. These creatures are ancient and exceedingly rare. They can endure for extended periods without sustenance or air, but they are not immune to the ravages of time or disease. A Kuatl can sense its impending demise up to a century in advance, yet it remains unaware of the specific circumstances of its death. When a Kuatl believes its imminent passing threatens its uncompleted tasks, or the well-being of those it protects, it embarks on a quest to find another of its kind. The mating ritual of Kuatls is a breathtaking display of magic and light, culminating in the creation of a gem-like egg from which a new Kuatl is born. The parent that sought out the mate assumes the role of caregiver, instructing the fledgling Kuatl in its duties, ensuring that it can carry on its mission after the parent's passing. Crawling claws are gruesome creations, consisting of severed hands animated through dark magic, driven by a malevolent intent to kill. These macabre entities find their origins in sinister necromantic rituals that bind the life force of a murderer to their severed hand, enabling it to continue its murderous rampage. The rituals responsible for the creation of crawling claws are most effective when performed on the freshly severed hand of a murderer. To obtain suitable hands, those who practice these dark arts may attend public executions or make unsavory bargains with assassins and torturers. Once animated, a crawling claw becomes entirely subservient to its creator's will. The creator can exert mental control over the claw as long as it remains within sight. Should the creator cease to command it, the crawling claw will obediently carry out its last directive to the best of its ability. The commands given to a crawling claw must be straightforward, as its limited senses and intellect prevent it from tracking specific individuals. However, it excels at carrying out simple instructions, such as slaughtering all creatures in a designated location, thanks to its keen sense of touch, which allows it to navigate through various obstacles. Despite its origins as part of a living being, a crawling claw possesses only fragments of the intellect and memories of its former self. Instead, it embodies the negative emotions that drove its living counterpart to commit murder. Left to its own devices, a crawling claw replicates the same murderous acts it perpetrated in life. In rare cases, if a crawling claw is created from the hand of a still-living murderer, the ritual binds it to the murderer's soul. The claw can then reattach itself to the murderer's limb, seemingly healing the severed appendage. When separated, the living body falls into a coma, and destroying the claw while it is detached leads to the death of the murderer. However, the destruction of the murderer does not affect the crawling claw itself. Cyclopes are formidable one-eyed giants inhabiting untamed wilderness areas. They are solitary beings who tend to steer clear of interactions with other races, and often go to great lengths to drive away intruders in their territory. While myths suggest that Cyclopes are the offspring of a god from the giant's pantheon, they are generally non-religious. Cyclopes typically have little interest in deities. 
viewing prayers and rituals as overly complex and unfamiliar practices. However, when a cyclops directly benefits from a divine sight or faces a supernatural threat, they may pay homage to a deity as long as the benefit or threat persists. Despite their reasonable intelligence, cyclopes lead simple lives in isolation. They raise herds of animals for sustenance and prefer to dwell alone or in small family units, often taking shelter in caves, ruins, or basic stone structures they construct themselves. At night, they house their herd animals with them and seal their dwellings with large stones, effectively transforming them into barns. Cyclopes establish their lairs within a day's journey of other cyclopes to facilitate trade and mating. They create wooden and stone weapons and tools, occasionally using metal when available. Communication among cyclopes is rudimentary, relying on grunts and gestures, as they speak sparingly and have no written language. In their trade, cyclopes do not use currency but value shiny and colorful objects like gold, shells, and other adornments as jewelry. Their personal ornaments often feature feathers, silver coins, pewter goblets, cutlery, and various bits of salvaged metal. While formidable in combat due to their immense size and strength, cyclopes are not known for their intelligence or strategic thinking. They struggle to adapt to new ideas and innovations, making them susceptible to cunning adversaries. Cyclopes can be easily impressed and manipulated by overt displays of magic. Lacking exposure to such phenomena, they might mistake a warlock, cleric, or another spellcaster for a powerful divine entity. However, if they discover that their assumptions were incorrect, their prideful nature drives them to react with vengeful and violent fury toward the presumed god. Dark mantles are stealthy and deceptive creatures that inhabit cavern ceilings, resembling stalactites or unremarkable stone formations. They remain completely motionless, patiently waiting for unsuspecting creatures to pass beneath them. Once potential prey is in range, a dark mantle drops from the ceiling, unfurls its membranous wings, and shrouds itself in magical darkness as it engulfs and crushes its victim. These creatures are commonly found in the depths of the Underdark, where they employ their ambush tactics to hunt. However, they are equally prevalent in the Shadowfell, where they serve a role analogous to that of bats on the material plane. In the Shadowfell, dark mantles thrive and are sometimes trained by intelligent denizens as guardians or companions. Dark mantles' ability to mimic inanimate objects and their capacity to create magical darkness make them formidable predators in their subterranean and shadowy habitats. A Death Knight is a fearsome, undead creature that was once a fallen paladin. When a paladin who has strayed from their virtuous path dies without seeking atonement, dark powers can transform them into a malevolent, undead being. The Death Knight appears as a skeletal warrior adorned in menacing plate armor, under its helmet, you'll find a skull with malevolent pinpoints of light burning in its eye sockets. Despite its undead nature, a Death Knight retains the ability to cast divine spells. However, it can no longer use its magic for healing purposes. Additionally, a Death Knight has the power to attract and command lesser undead creatures. These minions often include skeletal warhorses or nightmarish steeds serving as the Death Knight's mounts. In some cases, Death Knights who serve powerful fiends may command fiendish followers instead. What sets a Death Knight apart is its immortality, at least in an undead sense. Even after being destroyed, a Death Knight can rise again. Only through atonement for its past wickedness or by finding redemption can a Death Knight break free from its undead purgatory and finally meet its true demise. A Death Knight is a fearsome, undead creature that was once a fallen paladin. When a paladin who has strayed from their virtuous path dies without seeking atonement, dark powers can transform them into a malevolent, undead being. The Death Knight appears as a skeletal warrior adorned in menacing plate armor. Under its helmet, you'll find a skull with malevolent pinpoints of light burning in its eye sockets. Despite its undead nature, a Death Knight retains the ability to cast divine spells. However, it can no longer use its magic for healing purposes. 
Additionally, a Death Knight has the power to attract and command lesser undead creatures. These minions often include skeletal warhorses or nightmarish steeds serving as the Death Knight's mounts. In some cases, Death Knights who serve powerful fiends may command fiendish followers instead. What sets a Death Knight apart is its immortality, at least in an undead sense. Even after being destroyed, a Death Knight can rise again. Only through atonement for its past wickedness or by finding redemption can a Death Knight break free from its undead purgatory and finally meet its true demise. The immortality of a Lich hinges on a sinister practice feeding mortal souls to its phylactery. However, should a Lich falter or fail in this dark task, its once mighty form crumbles away until only its skull remains. In this diminished state known as a Demolish, it retains only a fraction of its malevolent life force. When disturbed, the skull levitates, assuming a wraith-like form and emitting a bone-chilling howl that can slay the weak-hearted and leave others in profound fear. When left undisturbed, it sinks back into its dormant existence. Becoming a Demelic is not a goal for most leeches, as it signifies the end of the existence they sought to preserve through undeath. However, as time passes, a lich's reason and memory can erode. It may retreat to its ancient tomb, forget to feed on souls, and lose the spells and arcane abilities it once possessed. Even in its reduced state as a mere skull, a Demolique remains a deadly and vexing adversary. Despite this diminished form, the Lich's phylactery endures. As long as the phylactery remains intact, the Demelic cannot be permanently destroyed. Should the Demelic possess the presence of mind to do so, it can regain its former power by feeding just one soul to its phylactery. This act restores the Demelic to its full Lich form, reconstituting its undead body and all its dark powers. Demons born in the dreadful depths of the infinite layers of the abyss are the harbingers of chaos and evil, driven solely by the desire to bring destruction and suffering to the cosmos. These vile creatures have no room for compassion, empathy, or mercy in their hearts. Their existence revolves around devastation. The abyss spawns demons spontaneously, giving rise to various fiends formed from filth and carnage. Some demons are unique monstrosities, while others belong to uniform strains with similar traits. Certain demons, like the manes, are created from the souls of mortals shunned or cursed by the gods, or those imprisoned in the abyss. This relentless chaos churns forth these nightmarish creatures. Demons respect power above all else. In their violent hierarchy, greater demons command hordes of lesser ones because of their sheer might. A demon's status rises with the blood it spills. The more enemies it annihilates, the mightier it becomes. A demon can ascend through the ranks, evolving from a lowly manes to a fearsome vrock after surviving countless horrors in the abyss. Yet such promotions are rare, as most demons meet their end before achieving significant power. The survivors, however, become the dreaded demon lords who threaten to tear the abyss asunder with their eternal conflicts. By expending immense magical power, demon lords can elevate lesser demons to greater forms, but these promotions are never based on deeds or accomplishments. Instead, a demon lord might transform a manes into a quasit when it needs an invisible spy, or turn a legion of dretches into hezris when confronting a rival lord. Demon lords are cautious about elevating demons to the highest ranks, fearing they might inadvertently create rivals to their own power. Demons perpetually seek portals to other planes while wandering the abyss. They yearn to escape their home realm, spreading their malevolence throughout the multiverse. When they breach into other planes, they unleash havoc, undo the work of gods, dismantle civilizations, and reduce worlds to despair and ruin. Some of the darkest legends in the mortal realm revolve around the devastation wrought by unleashed demons. Nations in conflict will even join forces to contain a demonic outbreak, temporarily setting aside their differences to prevent the fiends from causing further destruction. Demons bring corruption with them wherever they go, changing the world for the worse. 
plants wither and die in their presence, and animals shun the sites of demonic activities. Locations infested by demons might bear a perpetual stench, experience extreme temperatures, or be plagued by enduring shadows marking the fiend's lingering presence. In the eyes of demons, death outside the abyss is a minor inconvenience. Mundane weapons are powerless against them, and many demons resist even the most potent spells. When a hero manages to defeat a demon in battle, it dissolves into foul ichor, only to reform instantly in the abyss. The only way to permanently destroy a demon is to seek it in the abyss and vanquish it there. To safeguard their existence, powerful demons create amulets using abyssal metals and secret methods containing a portion of their life essence. If their physical form is destroyed, these amulets allow them to choose when and where to reform. Obtaining a demonic amulet is perilous, for seeking such a device risks drawing the demon's attention. Possessing a demonic amulet grants leverage over the demon, its possessor can demand favors or inflict torment upon the fiend if it resists. Destroying the amulet, however, imprisons the demon in the abyss for a year and a day. Despite the risks involved in dealing with fiends, many mortals covet demonic power. Demon lords manipulate these mortal servants into committing greater acts of depravity, furthering the demon lord's ambitions in exchange for magical powers and other boons. However, demons see their mortal followers as expendable tools and discard them at will, consigning their souls to the abyss. Summoning a demon is a perilous endeavor. Even mages who deal with devils fear the unpredictable nature of demons. Though demons yearn to sow chaos on the material plane, they show no gratitude when summoned, instead demanding release. Individuals who summon demons often do so to extract information, coerce them into service, or send them on missions that only creatures of absolute evil can undertake. The summoner must be well prepared and knowledgeable about spells and magic items to control a demon. One mistake can lead to the demon breaking free and wreaking havoc. Binding demons into objects is a dark art described in tomes like the Book of Vile Darkness, the Black Scrolls of Om, and the Demonomicon of Jideg Wilv. These objects trap the demon's essence on the material plane, preventing its return to the abyss. Creating such an object requires unholy incantations and the shedding of innocent blood. Possessing an object, possessing an object that binds a demon grants control over the demon within, although it corrupts those who handle it. Destroying the object releases the demon, who immediately seeks revenge against its captor. Even if bound securely, a powerful demon can sometimes escape its containment and possess a mortal host. When a demon's essence emerges from its prison, it can take over a host, sometimes subtly and other times with violent malevolence. While in possession of a host, the demon puts the host's soul at risk of being dragged to the abyss if exercised or upon the host's death. Only powerful magic can expel the demonic spirit. Demon lords rise to power through ruthless cunning or brute force, aiming to claim absolute control over the abyss. The abyss rewards outsiders who conquer its infinite layers, offering them a path to become demon lords themselves. Demon lords wield immense power, enabling them to shape their abyssal realms to their twisted desires. They rarely leave their domains to avoid allowing others to seize control. If a demon lord dies on another plane, its essence returns to the abyss and reforms into a new body. Yet, if it perishes within the abyss, it is destroyed permanently. Most demon lords safeguard a portion of their essence to prevent such a fate. Baphomet, the Horned King and Prince of Beasts, rules over minotaurs and other savage creatures. He seeks to dissolve civilization and encourage primal savagery. Baphomet resembles a gigantic black-furred minotaur with iron horns, blood-red eyes, and a blood-soaked mouth. His crown is adorned with the decapitated heads of his enemies, and his dark armor features spikes and skull-like decorations. Baphomet wields a massive glaive named Heart Cleaver, and he often hurls it into battle before engaging foes with his horns and hooves. Demogorgon, also known as the Sibilant Beast and the Prince of Demons, is a chaotic entity of madness. 
he aspires to unravel the order of the multiverse, spreading fear and hatred among other demons and demon lords. Demogorgon stands three times the height of a human, with a sinuous, snake-like body and suckered tentacles in place of arms. His saurian lower torso ends in webbed, clawed feet, and he possesses a forked tail tipped with cruel blades. Two baboon heads, both deranged, crown his monstrous form, each representing a different aspect of his dual nature. Grazist, the Dark Prince, is nearly nine feet tall and exudes an air of dark allure. Among demon lords, he appears the most humanoid, but this belies his capacity for evil. Grazist's ebon skin, pointed ears, yellow fangs, crown of horns, and six-fingered hands reveal his demonic nature. He revels in luxury, pageantry, and indulgence, often surrounded by incubi and succubi. Jublex, the faceless lord, is the demon lord of slimes and oozes. This wretched creature cares only about converting all life into formless copies of itself. In a resting state, Jublex spreads as a noxious mass, emitting a foul stench. When provoked, it forms a shuddering cone of slime with red eyes and dripping pseudopods. Jublex contaminates all it touches. Lolth, the demon queen of spiders, is the evil matron of the drow. Malice dominates her every thought as she weaves plots across the material plane, striving for the day her drow followers bring the world under her dominion. She appears as a lithe drow matriarch when interacting with her followers, but transforms into a giant demonic spider with spike-tipped legs and mandibles when combat demands it. Orcus, known as the demon prince of undeath and the blood lord, is revered by undead creatures and those who wield the power of undeath. A brooding and nihilistic entity, Orcus seeks to plunge the multiverse into a realm of death and darkness, unchanging except by his will. Orcus's corpulent form boasts a humanoid torso, powerful goat legs, and the head of a decaying ram. Bat-like wings sprout from his back, and he wields the wand of Orcus, a malevolent artifact. His surroundings are teeming with undead, and living beings not under his control are his enemies. Yenogu, the Knoll Lord and the Beast of Butchery, craves senseless slaughter and destruction. Knolls are his instruments, committing ever greater atrocities under his name. He delights in sorrow and seeks to turn the world into a wasteland where surviving gnolls battle each other for the right to feast upon the dead. Yenogu stands as a massive scarred knoll with a spiky crest, black spines, and emerald flaming eyes. His armor is a macabre collection of shields and breastplates adorned with the flayed skins of his enemies. Yenogu wields a triple flail known as the Butcher and uses his horns and hooves to tear apart foes. The Abyss is home to countless demon lords, and their exact number remains a mystery. Given the Abyss's infinite depths, powerful demons continually rise to become demon lords, only to fall as quickly as they ascend. Demons are categorized into different types, each reflecting their power and abilities. These types range from Type 1, the weakest, to Type 6, the strongest. Dretches, a Type 1 demon, are among the weakest. They are repulsive, self-loathing creatures doomed to spend eternity in a state of perpetual discontent. Their low intelligence makes them unsuitable for anything but the simplest tasks. However, what they lack in potential, they make up for in sheer malice. Dretches mill about in mobs, voicing their displeasure as an unsettling din of hoots, snarls, and grunts. Manes, also a type 1 demon, are the souls of evil creatures that descend to the lower planes and are transformed into manes, the lowest form of demon kind. These wretched fiends attack any non-demon they see and are called to the material plane by those seeking to sow death and chaos. Orcus, the prince of undeath, has the power to transform manes into undead monsters most often ghouls and shadows. Other demon lords feed on manes, destroying them utterly. Killing a manes causes it to dissipate into a cloud of reeking vapor that reforms into another manes after one day. Barlgarus, a type 1 demon, represent the savagery of the abyss. 
These hulking orangutans with gruesome faces and tusks jutting from their jaws stand just under eight feet tall, with broad shoulders and a weight of 650 pounds. They move apishly along the ground but climb with great speed and agility. Barlgurus gather in packs, take down tougher foes, and decorate their territory with gruesome trophies. Quasits are physically weak but mischievous. More powerful demons use quasits as spies and messengers when they aren't devouring them or pulling them apart to pass the time. A quasit can assume animal forms, but in its true form, it looks like a two-foot-tall green humanoid with a barbed tail and horns. The quasit has clawed fingers and toes, and these claws can deliver an irritating poison. It prefers to be invisible when it attacks. Shadow demons exist outside the normal abyssal hierarchy, often created by mortal magic, they feast on fears, memories, and doubts, appearing as insubstantial, winged humanoids. They all but disappear in the darkness and can creep about without making a sound. A shadow demon uses its insubstantial claws to feast on its victim's fears, taste its memories, and drink in its doubts. Bright light harries this fiend and shows its distinct shape, resolving it from a blur of darkness to a winged humanoid creature whose lower body trails off into nothing and whose claws rend a victim's mind. Hezrus, a type 3 demon, serve as foot soldiers in the demonic hordes of the Abyss. Although physically powerful, they are weak-minded and can easily be duped into sacrificing themselves by more powerful demons. As they press their attacks into the heart of an enemy's forces, their foul stench can sicken even the toughest foes, Chasms, also a type 3 demon, are loathsome demons that resemble an unspeakable cross between humanoid and fly. They shuffle about on four spindly legs that can find purchase on walls and ceilings. A droning sound precedes the approach of a chasm, inflicting foes with terrible lethargy that leaves them open to attack. The lowly chasms serve more powerful masters as interrogators or taskmasters and have a knack for spotting demons that have deserted their lords. Capturing and returning such traitors allows a chasm to torment the victim without fear of reprisal. Vrox, a type 3 demon, are dull-witted, capricious fiends that live only to create pain and carnage. A Vrock resembles a giant hybrid of humanoid and vulture, its gnarled, bestial body and broad wings stinking of awful. Vrox gleefully gobble up humanoid flesh, stunning potential prey with an ear-splitting shriek, then swooping down to attack with beak and claw. Vrox can shake their wings, releasing clouds of toxic spores. They covet pretty things, turning against each other for the chance to lay claim to cheap jewelry or ornamental stones. Despite their love of treasure, Vrox are difficult to bribe seeing no reason to bargain when they can simply take what they want from a would-be bargainer's corpse. Glabrizus, a type 4 demon, take great pleasure in destroying mortals through temptation and offer their service to creatures foolish enough to summon them. Although Glabrizus are devastating in combat, they prefer to tempt victims into ruin, using power or wealth as a lure. Engaging in guile, trickery, and evil bargains, a Glabrezu hoards riches that it uses to fulfill promises to short-sighted summoners and weak-willed mortals. If its attempts to entice or deceive fail, a Glabrezu has the strength to fight and win. Meriliths, a type 4 demon, are terrible to behold, with the lower body of a great serpent and the upper torso of a humanoid female with six arms. Wielding a wicked blade in each of its six hands, a Merilith is a devastating foe that few can match in battle. These demons possess keen minds and a finely honed sense of tactics, and they are able to lead and unite other demons in common cause. Meriliths are often encountered as captains at the head of a demonic horde, where they embrace any opportunity to rush headlong into battle. Nalfeshnis, a type 4 demon, are one of the most grotesque demons. They resemble corpulent mockeries of apes and boars standing twice the height of a human with feathered wings that seem too small for their bloated bodies. These brutish features conceal a remarkable intelligence and cunning. Nalfeshnis are devastating in combat, using their wings to soar above the front ranks and reach vulnerable adversaries that can be dispatched with little effort. 
From the thick of battle, they telepathically bellow commands to lesser demons, even as they inspire a sense of dread that forces their foes to scatter and run. Nalfeshnis feed on hatred and despair, but they crave humanoid flesh above all else. They keep their larders filled with humanoids abducted from the material plane, then eat those creatures alive during elaborate feasts. Thinking of themselves as refined and cultured, Nalfeshnis employ stained and rusted cutlery when they dine. Balers, a type 6 demon, represent ancient and terrible evil, commanding demonic armies and yearning to seize power while destroying any creatures that oppose them. They wield a flaming whip and a storm-infused longsword, channeling their power and rage into battle, even in death. In their death throes, they fall within a blast of fire that can destroy even the hardiest foes. Demon true names are a mysterious aspect of demonology. Though demons all have common names, every demon lord and every demon of type 1 through type 6 has a true name that it keeps secret. A demon can be forced to disclose its true name if charmed, and ancient scrolls and tomes are said to exist that list the true names of the most powerful demons. A mortal who learns a demon's true name can use powerful summoning magic to call the demon from the abyss and exercise some measure of control over it. However, most demons brought to the material plane in this manner do everything in their power to wreak havoc or sow discord and strife. 